Hello, good morning. Good morning. I like that you added a sign to the <laughs> This one off. Try the HDMI one more time. Oh, there we go. All right, I think we can get things started. All right, so I just want to thank you guys so much for coming on by this early in the morning. I really do appreciate it. So uh, for those who don't know, my name is Patricia Miranda. I am the co-founder of a blog and YouTube video named Old School Lane, where we talk about various topics from movies, TV shows, video games, and everything else in between. We also do a podcast called Casual Chats, where we have topics where we cover something similar with a whole group of different people. We even have interviews with people from um, artists, from uh, show creators, uh, musicians, actors, actresses, authors. So that's what we've been doing. We started around December of 2011. We started off as a blog, then we did the uh, podcast around November 2012, and then around, I would say maybe 2014 was when we started posting up videos online. So um, I'm hoping that the panel that I'm doing here, which is on writing analytical essays on media, will be able to be very informative. And uh, for those who are new to this, I hope that you can be able to take some tips into maybe even doing your own stuff. And as for those who are doing your own writing, I hope that maybe you can learn from a different perspective. Because I think that learning from different you know, ways of creativity and how people are able to express their own ways. I hope that maybe that will be able to look into a different light. So let's go into it. So I'm sure that some of you guys know about this, but um, yeah, what is an analytical essay? It's defined as an essay that examines a single topic to draw conclusions, give facts, or prove theories. Uh, usually when it comes to these kind of discussions, they're used in art, literature, music, movies, magazines, etc., to break down, exploring the themes and exploring the deeper meaning and their symbolism. Uh, some of the stuff that I like to cover are animation, movies, and television shows. Uh, my early years, I started working on a lot of Nickelodeon projects. So I started looking into shows like Hey Arnold, As Told by Ginger. I started even looking into um, other shows that I was really interested in recent years. I did Adventure Time and various others. I decided to look into them and find out, okay, what kind of new angle or what kind of things that I want to highlight that has been maybe overlooked or something that maybe not a lot of people have really thought about. I wanted to like give my own ideas and perspectives into it. Uh, one of my longest ones that I've ever done was an hour long discussion of is Disney's Doug really that bad? So I watched through the entire series and well, both of them. I watched the original Doug, I watched through Disney's Doug and kind of like put together on, you know, what was it like during the time period? What was it like when, the sh when both of those shows were out, how influential they were? And also, you know, what did each of them bring to the table compared to their contemporaries, which were out at the time, say like, the original Doug, when it came out, there weren't a lot of slice of life cartoons, which was able to express on everyday life as a kid growing up and being able to hang out with his friends and dealing with school issues. So we show back in the 80s. And I think that, um, you know, when Doug came out, it was like pretty revolutionary. And then when you have Disney's Doug, which came out in 96, you already had shows such as Arthur, you already had shows such as Hey Arnold, and then other shows such as Recess and Pepper Ann and Fillmore and Boy in Space and very, and even, you know, shows like Daria were able to like push what 
Doug kind of like laid the foundation for. So I was like, okay, well, a lot of people say that the show is bad, or even some people say, oh no, it was actually pretty good. So I was like, okay, as somebody who you know likes the first series, okay, why do people say it's bad? What are the flaws? What are the positives of it? And so that's what I decided to like look at it and break down to it. And I decided to like draw my own conclusion based off of my own personal experience. I think that also another thing is like generational. Like if you didn't grow up with it and you see something of that sort and you're like, oh, this isn't really that special. Or um, if you did grow up with it, it's like, oh, this is all we had. So we just kind of like took, took what we got. But at the same time, we kind of like look at it as like, okay, well, we're gonna just put our biases and nostalgia aside and we're just gonna face value on what it is. And if it was even that deep or even that important to begin with. So we're gonna talk about the different types of analytical essays, uh, which is literary and critical. So literally discusses about literature work and their significance, going into Doug again, you know, bringing on the importance of what it was able to do for slice of life animation, and then critical analyzing according to the writer's perspective. So when I do my research on various things, I like to like uh, look into what the creators were thinking of at the time. I look into researching on interviews that the creators have ever done, or even the writers, the actors. You could do this by looking at old magazine articles or maybe even old news reports or even as recently as books uh, that uh, a person would write and basically uh, interview them so that they can be able to have an idea on what they were thinking at the time. Like, you know, something that happened recently compared to something that happened 10 or 20 years ago, you kind of get like a new perspective. You kind of see like, you know, this is where I, I started and this is where I have been now where I have years of experience and looking back on what I've done. So yeah, I think that all of that you draw in so you can be able to bring into that perspective and bring into the context of, oh, okay, this is what was happening at the time. So usually these kinds of essays are for academic sense. Like you, you would see this in something like high school or even college if you're going into like, your English major or if you're going into like journalism I have a, a bachelor's degree in broadcast journalism with a minor in English focusing on professional writing so I used to do a lot of these like really deep essays where you have to write like 10 20 30 pages worth of stuff about one particular topic and you have to like look through every single thing so you can be able to cite your sources but in recent years, you see a lot more of these kind of videos on YouTube where people would like have like long discussions about like a show, whether it be like the entirety or maybe just like one little topic or maybe even doing a character study. So yeah, these have become pretty common nowadays. So why do we do it? Why do we analyze media? I'm sure that there's a lot of reasons why we want to do it. But for me, these are like the two major reasons for us as writers. It enhances the writing and comprehension skills by diving deep into a particular topic. We may know about a topic, like we may even know about like a TV show or movie that we grew up with, like we would watch it so many times that we would wear out the VHS tape or DVD or whichever that you grew up with. And I mean, sure you would like know like the quotes and what the character says, but you know, what about how they were able to write things down? Like, you know, why was the meaning behind this particular scene and why, why did that character say this? Or what was the context of that particular song? So um, when looking into like behind the scenes on what, what made them come up with the ideas of doing all of these things, um, you then get a broader perspective on it and you actually get an appreciation for it. And I think that it really just goes to show you about that you can even appreciate whatever media even more than what you've already known about like face value. Like if you grew up with a TV show and you've watched it so many times and you know about, you know, the makings of it, like, um, you know, what was in the writing room? How did the actors perform that? Maybe there was even some ad living, like each maybe musical cue was able to uh, showcase about, you know, the, the emotions of the song or what the character was going through by looking into it and finding out why this works or maybe even why it doesn't work, it's able to increase our skills into saying, okay, well, I know how they were able to work on this. What about the next thing? Well, uh, I think that if you look into maybe another show that's either similar to it, then you find out what they were able to do even better or maybe even eh, slightly, slightly worse. 
like, okay, well, going into, say, Doug again, I mean, they have, um, you know, they have different types of music, like they have um, Fred Newman and Dan Sawyer doing like the guitar riffs and the mouth sounds, and then you have Hey Arnold, for example, where you have Jim Lang going into the direction of jazz, uh, emulating um, Peanuts, where it had like a jazz soundtrack. Well, what made that work? Well, with the beatbox sounds that Fred Newman was able to do with Doug, he was able to emphasize that, you know, if you're a kid, you're not going to have access to a lot of instruments. So you just do like a whole bunch of mouth sounds and you just like bring in like the, the kookiness or even just like the um, subtlety of what it's like to be in a kid. And with um, Jim Lang's jazz soundtrack, you have the sophistication of being in a city where everything is pretty rough. I mean, I've just been into Atlanta like the second time and it's a little bit different where I currently live, where it's a little bit smaller in town. I mean, I grew up in New York City and various things, but it's been a long time since I've been in a massive city like this. So getting to see traffic and a whole bunch of like people walking around and it's like, you know, kind of like a bit of a whiplash, but at the same time, it's like you get to experience a new type of life or a life that you haven't experienced in a while. And that's what sometimes media is, that you get to experience things that you've never even thought of. like. Maybe a lot of you grew up in the city or in the country, or maybe even in a different city or state or country altogether. And then when you're seeing media from that perspective, it's like, okay, um, I'm experiencing something that I've never even seen before. So I'm gonna be able to see from that po point of view and find out, okay, how am I going to learn from this? How am I gonna be able to draw it in even to my own stuff? So I think that analyzing media can be really helpful with that. Another reason why that we analyze media is for the people who are watching or listening. It helps them understand and make sense on whatever they're looking into. Maybe somebody doesn't know about a particular movie or a TV show or a video game or type of music. And maybe they do know about it, maybe they just heard about it from word of mouth or something that they saw online, but maybe they wanna see people's perspective on it, if it's good, if it's bad, what makes it really unique, what makes it terrible. So sometimes they would even look into this and they would try to get a, an understanding on why it's you know talked about for good or for bad. I guess I could show after the, the presentation, but I actually did have a, a, a screen where I was going to showcase one of my um, um, my news my, my journalism um, news reports where I was able to like look into uh, a news report regarding about that somebody was going to be putting up a plaque in our local park for commemorating the first six African American women writers. <coughs> And I decided, okay, well, I'm going to go over to the place itself. I'm going to go over and interview the people who are a part of it. I got to talk to the governor. I got to talk to the granddaughter of one of the African-American women writer, uh, vo voters. And I was able to talk to the person who was in charge of putting the plaque together. And I wrote everything all in a concise one page and just like brought everything to the point because Usually when you're writing for news, it's about one hour, I mean, not one hour, one minute and 30 seconds, because everything needs to be precise. You need to know about the who, what, where, and why. You need to know about the details, and you need to know about the whole picture. So I'm just gonna show off this right here, that this is something that we have in journalism. It is called the inverted pyramid. The lead, the body, and the tail. So as mentioned before, the lead is the who, what, where, and why, and you have about like 30 words, one to two paragraphs, and you had to need to have a hook. My hook was, they're putting up a plaque for the first six African-American women voters. And, you know, they're finally being celebrated after like, you know, almost 100 years ago that they signed up to vote. And now their story is being shared because they never told this story to anybody else because you know they were um, they were afraid to talk about it and they just thought well it, it wasn't something that they really brought up so not even their grandchildren knew about it until the person who was in charge of putting the plaque who was a historian had looked into it and then she said okay I want to highlight these women and what they did and that's when they found out about it and so there was this huge celebration where they will they were able to celebrate the, the women who did this and there was this um, massive 
uh, parade and there were even like people who dressed up in 1920s garb and putting up signs saying, you know, uh, women voting. And I wrote that and I even did a video of it where I was able to present it to my class and um, I, I got good grades for it. I even did a whole 20 minute documentary as like my final thesis for my journalism class. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to put it up on film festivals, but for now this is uh, something that I'm still proud of. Um, as for like media, it's kind of like something similar that I do. I look into like the lead, the body, and the tail. I look into like whatever I'm talking about, whether it be a movie, a TV show, or what have you. I look about what's the most important information that I wanna like let people know about. Then I go into the body, which is the crucial information. I talk about, okay, well, what's the story behind this? What kind of topic that I want to really bring up? What's the evidence that I want to showcase to these people? And what are the details that are the most important for them to know? And then finally is the tale, which is just like the little leftovers, like uh, something that might be interesting to them, um, maybe like some extra content, just something that kind of like ties everything together. All right, now when it comes to choosing my media, how do I, um, you know, how do I choose what I want to do? So one thing, I choose a topic. Um, let's just say I want to talk about, say, Doug or Hey Arnold. I want to choose a point of view. I've done several videos of that. As mentioned before, I've talked about, is Disney Doug really that bad? I talked about the original Doug, where I say how it was influential with its simplicity. For Hey Arnold, I talked about uh, the origins, like where it first started, when it was just claymation puppets for Pee Wee's Playhouse, then it went into like various shorts, like um, Arnold Goes to Church, and then it goes into like when they were doing stuff on Sesame Street to doing the Simpsons illustration comics back in the 90s to eventually having the pilot that was featured on the movie Harry the Spy and then eventually got its own series about a few years later. So I go into all of that, go into a chronological order so that I can be able to pinpoint on which um, parts are the most important. Like if I wanna talk about say, you know, again, going into um, another topic on Doug is how is it influential with its simplicity? Well, I could talk about the storylines. I could talk about how the characters were portrayed. I could talk about the music. I could talk about the storylines. I can talk about all of those things and then just kind of like bring it all together. So an introduction with a thesis statement, you want to be able to get to the point on what you're talking about. Some people sometimes like to meander or they don't know when to bring it up. You want to bring it up immediately. In our day and age where people are kind of like, mm, they wanna have things like really quickly and right away. They just don't wanna like sit around and just like, okay, okay, I get it, what's the point? You know, where, where are you going with this? And so you wanna be able to just easily lure people in, like maybe within like the first two or three minutes and then hit them immediately with your thesis statement saying, I'm talking about this. You can lead into it, absolutely. That way people can be able to have an idea on that this is where you're going. But then afterwards, you wanna like follow it all the way through. You wanna make it clear and concise. You wanna be able to let them know, this is what I'm talking about. I don't wanna go all over the place with like talking about something else. Like if I'm talking about apples, I don't wanna go over about Abraham Lincoln or the Spanish Inquisition. It's like, what does that have to do with apples? I mean, I thought we were learning about Granny Smith and Gala, but okay, Abraham Lincoln and the Spanish Inquisition. Did they have anything to do with it? No, <laughs> why, why, why should I even listen to it? But yeah, you wanna make everything very consistent because you wanna be able to just draw people into what you're saying. You wanna be able to let them know that this is where you're going and you're not gonna lead anywhere else. Evidence, this is really important. Viable evidence on your essay. There are some people who like to do opinionated essays where people, they do have some evidence on why they feel that way, but it's not based off of research, it's based off of what a person was going through in their mind and what they were experiencing, even just like when they saw it, what did they personally think of it? Uh, if you are gonna go through any of these, whether it be through the critical essays or the literature essays or even opinionated, you wanna be able to prove the evidence, whether it be through you know, magazine articles or newspaper articles, interviews, books, you want to show them this this is why I feel this way because this said so this said so in my own personal experience you know I saw something similar to this so this is how I feel about it this is why I'm proving to you that this is why I feel that you know this topic 
is going in the direction that I think. Like the whole Disney's Doug isn't really that bad example. Uh, why, you know, why did people say that? Well, they said, oh, it's not as good as the original, but why? Why is it not as good as the original? Even as something as simple, and I've even seen people say this, oh, the sleeves weren't the same length, or it's just nine hairs, it's supposed to be seven or six. It's like, okay, what else? Well, I looked into it and I said, okay, well, what made it different? Well, the original Doug had two 11 minute episodes. Disney's Doug had 24 minute episodes. Did it work? In my opinion, it just made it a little bit slow because you know you were like jumping in between different stories and it, it felt like a little bit um, monotonous at points. Uh, another one that I felt was because um, I felt that the main character was a little bit unlikable in his first few episodes and I stated on reasons why. I even showcased it in a few clips. And then I uh, put into the discussion about like, okay, the continuity is not matching up with the original. Like there's some points in which they were saying, okay, well, I feel that um, in this episode where he said this, well, it contradicts another thing where he said in that episode where he feels about this. Like, okay, well, well in one episode, um, the main character, Patty Mayonnaise, she couldn't sing. Well, we saw her in one episode of Dis in you know the original Doug that she could sing, but then in Disney's Doug she can't sing, so it doesn't match up with the continuity. So you know you can bring up those things as your evidence, or you can bring up um, in one chapter of a book called um, uh, "Slimed: An Oral History of Nickelodeon's Golden Age" by Matthew Clickstein, where the creator Jim Jenkins himself said that you know he didn't put in as much time on working on Disney's Doug compared to Nickelodeon's Doug because he was working on so many other projects at the time. So uh, he was working on things such as like Allegra's Window and then the 101 Dalmatian series and PB and J Otter. So he didn't have as much time to put into it compared to like the original. So, you know, you can put into that perspective on why maybe some things weren't as good. Okay, and then another thing that might be important is um, provide any information that may contrast with your opinion. I think that that's also really important that you find something that kind of like contradicts of what you're saying because it shows off that it's not just like a one-way street. There could be different sides of directions of where your discussion could go into. Uh, you know, you could say, okay, well, I didn't like this part, but I know what they were going with this because it helps with the characters or it was consistent with the storyline. So I will give it credit for that. Or, well, I didn't like the way that this character was acting, but in this context, I can see what they were trying to do. Maybe they didn't pull it off as well, but again, I can see what they were trying to do, like maybe going into that kind of example. And then finally, you just wanna give a summary to close out your essay. You wanna be able to just you know, round up everything together. You wanna to have a good beginning and you wanna have a good end to kind of like tie everything together. All right, so how do you do research on your essay? Well, one, definitely, and this is really important, be familiar with your topic. This is really crucial because if you're saying that, okay, I'm gonna do research on this particular TV show or movie, you wanna know the ins and outs of it. I mean, first of all, you know, watch it. Maybe another thing that you wanna do is like, maybe even look the behind the scenes of it. Uh, whether it be like, maybe they have extras or maybe you can search for the extras yourself, but being familiar with your topic is crucial for doing your essay. That way, when you're talking about it, you actually have an idea on what you're saying and people will have an idea on what you're saying. Break it down into chunks for easy consumption. This is also another thing. You don't wanna like, you know, gobble everything all at once. It can become super overwhelming. So you wanna just break it down. You wanna break it down for like, you know, as we mentioned before with the inverted uh, pyramid. You wanna break it down to the main topic, the details, and then finally just the last pieces. Um, maybe even for like a case where you're talking about media, you want to break it down with like, you know, the story, the characters, the setting, um, even like little details like that. You, if you want to talk about that too, uh, you can, but you want to like leave it towards the end. But yeah, you want to be able to just like have an easy breakdown so it doesn't overwhelm you and you don't overwhelm your audience. Uh, make your essay as unique as possible. You want to be able to have a different perspective on it compared to like what other people have said. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more later on, but I think that doing a new spin on something will make people like really pay attention. 
I'm sure that there's a lot of videos out there talking about a certain movie or TV show. I'm sure that there's like a uh, hundred movies, uh, you know, movie discussions about the Marvel Cinematic Universe or Star Wars or maybe like the, even the newest um, animated show. But you want to do a different spin on it. Some people do reactions to it. Some people do analytical videos. Some people like break it down episode by episode. You want to do your own unique spin on it. And I think that by doing your own unique spin on it, people don't say that it's derivative and people won't say that you're just copying off of somebody else. Make sure that you have uh, well-proven research materials. There's a reason why people say, don't use Wikipedia as your main uh, source of, of research because um, you know, I think that Wikipedia is a good place to start, but you don't want to use like the whole thing. There's articles that are connected to it, but you want to use like viable sources, like maybe Variety or The Hollywood Reporter or any of those places where you can say, okay, this is like where all the information is from, like maybe some stuff that you've never heard behind the scenes or even like, you know, even news reports where, you know, the journalists are there actually talking to the people who are working on this and then they have an inside story that you don't see anywhere else. That stuff will strengthen your essay and it'll strengthen your proof or even your statement on why you feel about something. If you cannot find the materials that you're looking for, get it yourself. Now, this might be a little bit overwhelming. It's like, what do you mean? How, how do I get this? Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I do interviews for my podcast and I get like various people. I get um, you know authors, I get uh, show creators, I get uh, actors, actresses, and I reach out to them and see if they wanted to um, you know be on my podcast so that we can be able to get some insights on things that they've never heard of before. What I do is that I either reach out to their managers via their official website or social media outlets. They have a website and it, you know they have like a little contact that says contact this person. And if um, they have like an email, especially a direct email, that'd be even better. And you could just like click on it and then just write down, hey, my name is so-and-so, uh, I do a podcast. I was wondering if I can have you on by to talk about this project. And if they say yes, then that would be a great opportunity for you to get some insight on some things that you wanted to know about. But if they say no, uh, you know, don't think of it as like, oh, you know, they're not interested. Sometimes you have to be a little persistent. There was one time many years ago where I wanted to get a hold of Joe Murray, the creator of Rocco's Modern Life, and I wrote to him about 2014. Didn't get a hold of him until 2017. And, it, and he even said to me, wow, you're persistent, aren't you? Yeah. He, what, he uh, it, it, it was even the same thing with uh, Craig Bartlett. I wrote to him in 2012, didn't hear back until 2014. <coughs> so even if it takes a long time, if you're, if you're persistent, but not to the point in which you're like constantly annoying, like writing every hour. It's like, don't do that. I mean, these people have their own lives, they're busy. Like, you know, just space it out. It's like maybe, you know, every, you know, maybe like every two weeks or maybe like every month. And if you don't hear anything, just wait it out. I mean, they'll, they'll answer eventually. Or if they don't, then that's okay. You can just move on to the next person who may even know similar information. So if I do get a hold of the person, I like to look into previous interviews before producing the questions because uh, sometimes, I mean, I'm sure you guys have been to a lot of panels this weekend that, you know, maybe some people would ask questions that you already knew about or, you know, they've heard like a hundred times. I would like to say that if you can be able to look in previous interviews, like look at old articles or even old podcasts, and they've already answered a question like that, then try to come up with a new question that nobody's ever asked before. I think that that will give people uh, an idea on some topics that they never even thought of before, or it'll give the listeners something else, you know, something really interesting to listen to, because if they know about this show, or if they know about this person, they've already heard everything. So bringing in a new spin on questions that they've never heard before would really draw you, draw people into it. So another thing that I also learned is before interviewing someone, doing icebreaker interview questions. It makes you feel more natural, and it makes you feel more comfortable when talking to them. So something like, you know, um, how was your day so far? I'm glad that you're able to come on by and, um, you know, do the podcast. I really do appreciate it. And I'm also really happy that you're able to, you know, do this, sh you know, show or movie that I really enjoyed. You know, even like something as simple as like, you know, how's your, how's your day been? Any other projects that you're doing? Stuff like that. I think it was 2013 that uh, the co-founder of Old School Lane and my friend Kevin Guglielmo 
was really excited on uh, interviewing Renee Jacobs, who was the, the original April O'Neil on TMNT. And, you know, he was a little bit nervous at first about um, talking to her because, you know, he's a massive TMNT fan. And so he um, was kind of like joking around a little bit. And I think that there were some points in which, um, you know, Renee, you know, felt like, okay, you know, I don't, I don't think they're, they're treating me as seriously, but I think that deep down inside, he was a little bit nervous. But uh, yeah, I think that, you know, being optimistic about who you're interviewing is really important and that's fine. It just doesn't come across as like, oh, you're just like this one person who's just literally asking your question. It's like, so uh, please tell us about your work. It's like a deadpan face. It's like, you, you wanna be more natural and you wanna be actually excited that you're talking about, uh, you know, your favorite topic in front of the person that you really um, look up to. So you wanna be able to actually have an idea on how you're gonna to react to people. I know some people might be a little shy, some people might be a little bit nervous, or some people might be a, like really, really like optimistic, but I think there has to be like that level of, okay, you know, this is where I want to be. And I think icebreaker is really important because you're able to just naturally be yourself and being able to just open up and to saying, you know, this is where I wanna be able to learn and where I want to be able to get an idea on how I want to approach this person. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry everybody, I don't think that this PowerPoint is going to be opening up, so I'll just finish off the rest with what I have. So yeah, I, I think that uh, another crucial thing about like doing your own research and you know when you're interviewing somebody is that you want to be able to let them do the talking and you listening. You know, have all of your questions ready and then when you ask your first question, don't say anything. Let them do the talking. While they're doing the talking and you're listening, and if you catch on to like, okay, I know what my next question is gonna be and I know what I can lead up to, it's really important because you don't wanna be like saying, okay, while well, they're talking and then you interrupt them because it breaks the flow of the conversation. And you want to be able to just let them do the talking and just let them express themselves. Remember, it's about them, it's not about you. And also you want to make sure that your questions are open-ended. Because you, if, if you're asking a question, it's like, okay, um, what color's the sky? Blue. Question's over, go to the next one. Okay, well, how about um, another question about like, okay, well, why is the sky blue? Okay, well, the reason why is because of like particles and stuff like that. They can go longer into that as opposed to like, you know, is the sky blue or what color is the sky? You want to have open-ended questions that can engage in conversation. If you just have closed-ended questions that can either end in a yes or no, you're pretty much finished because that's just, that's just something that you don't want to do because then your interview will be pretty short and nothing will, you, you won't gain from anything and you're, neither will the person gain from anything. And I think finally, you wanna be able to conclude it off with saying, hey, you know, I really did appreciate you coming on by, thank you so much, show your gratitude. Because if you do, then that person will be really thankful that you, you, that you even cared about what they were doing. I mean, a lot of times these people, they do their work and they don't even know about the reaction of the people until they're actually told about it. Even in like, um, in recent years, you know, with like social media and stuff like that, they were able to like, have an idea on it because they were able to interact with the people who were into their stuff. But back then, unless they were going over to a convention or something like that, they had no idea. They had no idea that anything that they ever did impacted them. So I just wanna round things off with talking about that you have to make at the same time, you know, your own stuff, but make it uniquely you, but don't worry about like copying anybody. There's this really interesting book called Steal Like an Artist by Astor Cloyne, uh, Austin Cloyne, sorry, where he was talking about like steal like a, don't steal like a thief, steal like an artist, where he was saying about that, you know, there's nothing new under the book, that, you know, everything that has already been done previously, uh, people tend to repeat it over and over and over again. If the formula works, just keep on it, but at the same time, do it your own unique way. Even Pablo Picasso said himself, Good artists borrow, great artists steal. And what that means is, if something works, you can do it, but at the same time, you don't wanna like literally copy it verbatim like a thief. If you see something that you're really interested in, take elements from it, but make it your own thing. 
That's what he means by stealing like an artist. Like, if you like analytical essays, all right, well, what is it about it that you like? Okay, well, I like the fact that you're able to learn something new from it. I like the fact that you're able to d dive deep into something that ordinarily you would have never known about. But how do you present it? Do you present it in a way that's like more in, you know, intellectual as opposed to like entertaining? Do you do more of the entertaining and doing the jokes as opposed to the um, articulate stuff? It depends on how you feel. And also, if you're gonna be able to like do this, like do more of just one, the first time is not gonna be the best time. You're gonna stumble, you're gonna fail, you're gonna not do as well. That's why you keep on doing it over and over and over again until eventually you start getting your footing in. I probably didn't get my footing in until like maybe five or six years after I started my, my blog and my podcast. I, I feel like I'm much better now than I was about 10 years ago. So if you're feeling like really upset or devastated that you're not as good as the people who are doing it out there, remember that they didn't start off as good either. That's what time does. It makes you be, be better on what you're doing and it makes you be better on learning everything. You learn from people, you learn from experience, you learn from everything. And by that, it makes you as a better person, it makes you as a better writer, and it makes you as a better analytical per uh, you know, uh, somebody who does a lot of analyzing. So yeah, I think that that uh, wraps everything up. So I, again, want to thank you so much for coming on by. I really do appreciate it. So thank you. So if anybody has any questions, uh, you can raise your hand and stand up. Uh, yes, please. Uh, when you're researching for your essay, how do you take your, how do you take notes, organize your notes, you know, like what do you look for, how do you, how are you able to like easily recall that information, you know, very easily, just kind of like. Oh yeah, that's a good question. So, how I organize my notes, I look into everything. I have it divided into like different sections, like, okay, well, uh, going into Hey Arnold again, I wrote about uh, Hey Arnold's Christmas episode, if anybody is familiar with that where it, it goes into like the Vietnam War. And so I was thinking, okay, well, there's like different sections of this episode that I can look into, like the, the plot where, you know, Arnold is trying to find a good um, present for Mr. Wynn, and then he learns about that, you know, he lost his daughter Mai over to some soldiers when they were escaping from the Vietnam War. Okay, well, I'm gonna look into some information about the Vietnam War. Okay, well, you know, what, what, you know, which part of the Vietnam War were they talking about? Well, most likely from like doing research on like the episode alone where, you know, they were trying to escape from the helicopter. It looked like the Battle of Saigon from 1975. And then I kind of like put the pieces together about like maybe um, it's referencing, um, you know, other things that were in the episode. So I just like look up some research on the Battle of Saigon, like what were the people going through at the time? And also with, um, you know, a, a line that he said that it took him 20 years to get out of the country. Well, why was that? Well, we, it was because when um, Vietnam was conquered uh, in, you know, in Ho Chi Minh City that a lot of the people couldn't leave as easily, but it wasn't until like around the 80s and 90s in which there was a lot of, um, you know, there was a lot of push into like a lot of merchandise when they were making like clothes and other um, things that they were able to distribute to the American market. So that was when he was about to uh, finally get out and do all of his searching. And then, you know, looking into like other things, I just put everything into like, um, I have like a Google sheet back then I had to like write everything on a piece of paper and just like try to like jumble all of my notes into like something that's concise. So that's what I do is that I look into what the topic is and I just write down everything. And then when I look into what I'm talking about, then I start piecing it all together. Okay, so Google Sheets would be a good... Yeah, I would say Google Sheets because it's a little bit more organized or maybe even if you're more of a... Um, uh, um, if you were more into like uh, just writing everything down like on notes, notes are okay too if you wanna just um, make it a little bit more shorter, but that's what I would do. I would just say Google Sheets, like putting down like different sections like, okay, plot point, character, uh, this particular scene, I just like write down everything. Thank you. Uh, anybody else have any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so my question is, uh, you know, when you're analyzing something, how do you uh, how do you train yourself, or what are some pointers you can give to be more attentive to, you know, some details, uh, you know, like, I mean, either in film or, you know, a comic book or other media that, you know, like, I mean, 
uh, are very subtle, but you know, are quite consequential in their implications. So, you know, like, I mean, how do you, how, what are your tips on, you know, like, I mean, how to, how, how to catch those things? If that's really difficult, especially if it is subtle, like um, maybe just like a scene in the background or even like the way that a person looks or even the music that is playing. I think that you have to be familiar with those in order for you to catch it. Even if uh, you're not familiar with it and you notice something like, why are they standing there for that long? Or, you know, why is this like, you know, music, you know, playing all of a sudden or um, anything like that. I think that by trying to catch in those little details, what I would do is, is that I would look at a scene that is like that over and over again and find out, okay, why is this here? And then I would just say, oh, okay, I think I know what they're doing. They're trying to reference this, or they're trying to bring up that this person is going through this thing, or, okay, well, now we're going to jump over from act two to act three. So they always have those little subtle things that um, kind of like transitions from one thing to another by pointing it out. Again, I think that it's about like looking at it over and over and over again to kind of like see that um, I think that uh, it, it takes a little bit of time to do it, but I think that once you kind of like get a context of to how other people or how other media is able to do that, I think that you'll be able to get it. Uh, that, that's a great question, by the way. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Unbiased, oh, that's a really good question. So yeah, I think that all of us, even if we don't admit it, we do have a ten, we do tend to have a certain bias on things, like of how we are able to see media, um, whether it be with its faults or with its praises, how to remove that. So again, you wanna look into something based value and you wanna be able to see what they were trying to say or what they were trying to do in a particular scene or how the character acts. I think that knowing about that context, you would kind of like get an idea about like, okay, well, this person was acting mean to this person. Well, the upbringing is, you know, why they're acting this way. Like uh, going into S told by Ginger again. A lot of people say that Miranda Kilgallen, who's like one of the school bullies in the show, is like, why is she acting so mean? You know, why is she acting this mean? You know, this mean to um, you know the main character? Well, if we look into the context, well, she her father is a police officer and a drill sergeant. So, you know, she grew up in a disciplined home and, you know, this is what she, you know, this is what all she knew about. Or, you know, going into like, uh, you know, why is this, um, you know, why is this storyline, why is it going this way? Like, you know, why, you know, why, what's with the twist? Well, I mean, if they're trying to give an element of surprise, then, you know, that then that's what they were trying to accomplish. Now, whether you like it or not, I mean, understanding what the context is, is one thing. Whether you like it or not, again, is a bit uh, difficult because we all tend to have our certain bias. Like, oh, I didn't like the way that that story turned out to be, or I didn't like the way that this character acted or anything like that. But once you understand it, it would make it a little bit better. But again, it's, ba it's based on personal preference. But, th but that's a great question, thank you. Anybody have any other questions? Yes. When you're doing news, yeah. You, when you're doing news, you have to be factual. You have to be to the point. People want to know about what's going on in the world. I mean, sure, there are some opinionated news uh, outlets that will tell you about like, oh, I don't like this governor or, you know, the way that they were able to do this particular law, I don't like it or, oh, this is good for the, um, the government or anything like that. It's... I get what they're saying in terms of like, you know, saying that statement, but I think that what's crucial about putting in your own writing into analytical media, being yourself, 
being who you are in terms of this is how I feel about something. I'm putting in my own self into this. Everything that I write in my analytical essays, I put myself into it. Uh, let's just say that, you know, going into um, I Sold My Ginger Again, I like that show because, you know, it was able to break a lot of new ground into showcasing a side of being a teenager that hasn't been shown a lot of times. And I felt that the show was, un, you know, uh, underrated and overlooked. Well, I put myself and my perspective on that. and then I'm able to kind of like write into it a little bit while at the same time giving off my facts and giving off what I personally you know, feel about it. So I think that putting yourself into it is able to help break a little bit up to just like, oh, you know, this is this and that. It's just like the facts. You know, when you're writing the facts, you're writing the material is what they're looking for. When you're writing an analytical, uh, analytical essay, it is, you know, the, the information that they're looking for, but it's also your perspective on what they're looking for. What is your saying on this? How do you say it? How do you feel about it? I think that that's really important. You're very welcome. Anybody else? All right, well, I just wanna thank you so much for coming on by. This has been amazing. I hope that you really enjoyed us talking about this. I hope that you got something from this. And yeah, I wanna say, I hope that whatever that you're writing, I hope that, again, it'll be a really good one, even though if it doesn't start off that way, just keep on going. That's all I can say, just keep on going. So thank you, everyone. <laughs> And if you want to find out more about my stuff, um, I have uh, several media outlets. I have a blog, which is oldschoollane.net. I have a Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash oldschoollane. I have a YouTube channel, which is uh, youtube.com slash oldschoollane. You can follow me on Twitter, which is at patty underscore b underscore Miranda. Uh, I have a podcast called Old School Lane Casual Chats. We just reached our 200th episode after 10 years. And I also do many other podcasts. I do Picks Mix, where myself and my co-host, Aaron Meta from The Aaron Meta Show, we talk about Pixar films. I do Dream Machine, where um, he and I talk about DreamWorks films. We're currently doing uh, Journey to the Blue Sky, where we're talking about Blue Sky Studios films. We do, we've done the Roald Dahl Retrospective, where we looked at Roald Dahl movies and adaptations. Um, I've also done Where in Between, which is a podcast where Myself, Casey Reed, and Ashley Whittingkeller from the Friday Night Nicktoons podcast watched every episode of As Told by Ginger. We even had guests on the show where uh, they talked about their experiences working on it. I've even done um, various um, reunion live streams where I had the cast and crew of certain shows uh, come on by and go over their experience. I've done three of them. I did As Told by Ginger, I did Hey Arnold, and I did The Angry Beavers uh, last uh, April, where I had the creator Mitch Shower and some of the casting, uh, the casting crew who worked on the show, and uh, I'm going to be working on another one this July. Uh, it, I'm going to announce it before anybody else, so uh, I hope that you um, uh, will tune into that um, around July. I'm going to be doing a 25th, uh, no, a 30th anniversary reunion live stream on the 1993 Nickelodeon show Wienerville. So if any of you guys are familiar with that, I'm going to be doing that this July. And I also have a lot of other things going on in terms of like my content. Um, again, going into casual chats, I also do In Search of the Crystal Skull where um, Araminta from the Araminta Show and I, we look at films from Rotten Tomatoes from 60% to 79% and find out are they really worth that low grade? And if so, why? And if not, you know, why? So that's all the stuff that I'm doing. I'm working on some other um, videos. I'm actually working on a video right now where I'm looking into, uh, how, how many of you guys are familiar with the, the game series, You Don't Know Jack? Uh, for those who don't know, You Don't Know Jack is like a series of party games where they have like um, a lot of non sequitur ways of trivia and drawing and, um, and you know, all those other games. You can play it with your friends. Uh, you can play it on your phones and on your devices. It's really easy, really great time for party nights. Well, believe it or not, back in 2001, they had a game show hosted by Paul Rubens, AKA Pee Wee Herman. And it was on ABC and it only lasted for six episodes. So I'm gonna be covering that next time for my videos. So yeah, I really do appreciate it. If you wanna like meet up with me and talk to me with more questions outside, then you can. And if not, then enjoy the rest of the convention. Thank you.